Memoirs of a Revolutionary by Victor Serge. This is the second part of chapter one. René Vallée, my friend, was a lively, restless spirit. We had met in the quarter Latin, quartier Latin. We had discussed everything together, usually at night around the St. Genevieve Hill, or Genevieve Hill, Genevieve Hill, in the little bars jostling on the boulevard. Saint Michel, Barre, Anatole France, Apollinaire, a Louis Na Nazi. Together we muttered scraps of Vildrac's White Bird, Jules Romaine's Ode to the Crowd, Jehan Rictus's The Ghost. Rene was law abiding and prosperous. He even had his own locksmith's workshop, not far from Denfair, Rochereau. I can see him there now, standing up like a young Siegfried, criticizing Anatoly France's treatment of the destruction of this planet. Having had his say, René would sink slowly down on the asphalt of the boulevard with a sly grin. What is certain is that we are all mugs. Yes, mugs. I remember his fine, square-set ginger head, his powerful chin, his green eyes, his strong hands, his athlete's bearing, an emancipated athlete, naturally. He liked to wear the Navy's wide corduroy trousers with a waistband of blue flannel. Once, on an evening of riots, we wandered together around a guillotine, ridden by our gloom, sickened by our feebleness, mad with anger. We have a wall in front of us, we told each other, and what a wall. Oh, the bastards, muttered my ginger-headed friend, and next day he confessed to me that all that night his hand had been closed upon the chill blackness of a browning revolver. Fight, fight, what else was there to do? And if it meant death, no matter. René rushed into mortal danger out of his sense of solidarity with his defeated mates, out of his need for battle, and at the heart of it, out of despair. These conscious egoists were going to get themselves slaughtered for friendship's sake. I had arrived in Paris a little after the death of Libertad, the luxurious Paris of Passy and the Champs-Élysées, and even of the great boulevards of commerce, was for us like a foreign or enemy city. Our own Paris had three centers the great working-class town that began somewhere in a grim zone of canals, cemeteries, waste plots, and factories around Charonne, Pantin, and the Flander Bridge. It climbed the heights of Belleville and Menilmontant, Men <laughs> Men and there it became a plebeian capital, lively, busy, and egalitarian like an ant heap. And then, on its frontiers with the town of railway stations and delights, became cluttered with shady districts. Small hotels for a short time, sleep cellars, where for 20 sous one could gasp in a garret without ventilation, pubs frequented by procurers, swarms of women with coiled hair and colored aprons soliciting on the pavements. The rumbling trains of the metro would suddenly plunge into a tunnel under the town, and I would linger in a circle of passers-by to hear and see Hercules in the boneless wonder, with their fantastic patter, clowns with a waggish dignity who always needed just another fifteen sous before they would perform their best tricks upon an old rug spread on the pavement. And inside another circle, as evening came on and the workshops emptied, the blind man, his stout female assistant, and the soulful orphan girl would sing the popular songs of the day, the Riders of the Moon, and in the ballad there was also some mention of dusky night and desperate love. Our Montmartre adjoined, but never met, the Montmartre of artists' taverns, bars haunted by women in feathered hats and hobble, hobble skirts, the Moulin Rouge, etc., we acknowledged only we acknowledged only old for days la pain agile where people sang old french songs some perhaps going back to the days of francois villon 
who was a wandering, despairing Mary Young Sprig, a poet, a rebel like us, and a gallows bird. The old Rue des Rossiers, where the generals Le Comte and Clément Thomas were shot under the commune, now renamed the Rue du Chevalier de la Barre, de la Barre had since the time of the barricades only changed its appearance at one point along its extent. There, at the top of the slope, the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur de Jésus was slothfully nearing completion in a sort of fake Hindu, monumentally bourgeois style. Hard by the stone yards here, young radical thinkers had put up a statue of the young Chevalier de la Barre, who had been burnt by the Inquisition. The basilica in the white marble chevalier looked down on the roofs of Paris, ocean of grey roofs, over which there arose at night only a few dim lights and a great red glow from the tumultuous squares. We would pause there to take stock of our ideas. At the other end of the street, a lopsided square stretched at the crossing of two roads, one a steep incline, the other rising in flights of dull grey steps. In front of a tall and ancient shuttered house, the journal Causerie, Causerie Populaire and the office, the offices of L'Anarchie, both founded by Libertad, occupied a shabby building filled with the noise of printing presses, singing and passionate discussion. There I met Rurette Maitre Jean, a short, slim, aggressive girl, militant with a gothic profile, and the theoretician Emile Armand. Armand. Sickly and goateed, his pince nez all askew, once a Salvation Army officer, lately a convict in sol solitary confinement. A stubborn, often subtle dialectician who used to argue purely on the basis of self. I only propose, never impose. He would almost splutter. Yet out of his spluttering emerged the most disastrous theory possible, that of illegalism. This transformed lovers of liberty, outsiders, enthusiasts for comradely living into technicians of obscure and illicit crafts. The most important subject of our discussions, some of which ended in shooting and bloodletting among comrades, was the importance of science. Should scientific law regulate the whole life of the new man to the exclusion of a rational sentiment and of all idealism inherited from ancestral faiths? Taine and Renan's blind cult of science, here reduced to almost algebraic formulae by fanatical popularizers, became the catechism of individualist revolt. Myself alone against all, and nothing means anything to me, as the Hegelian Max Stirner once proclaimed. The doctrine of comradely living slightly counteracted the unpardonable isolation of these rebels, but out of it was emerging a constricted coterie equipped with a psychological jargon demanding a long initiation. I found this coterie at once fascinating and repellent. I was at some distance from those primitive conceptions. Other influences were at work on me and there were other values that I neither could nor would abandon, basically the revolutionary idealism of the Russians. I had happened to find work easily at Belleville as a draftsman in a machine tool works, 10 hours a day, 12 and a half, including the journeys, starting at 6.30 a.m. In the evenings, I went by the, the funicular railway in the metro to the left bank, the, La the Latin Quarter, our third Paris, the one I liked best, to tell the truth. I had an hour and a half at my disposal to read at the St. Genevieve Library, with eyes that stubbornly refused to stay open over political economy, and a, and a tired intellect functioning now only at half-cock. I took to alcohol to help me to read, but I only forgot everything the following day. I left the brutalizing atmosphere of my good job, the pallid fascination of the Chaumont Hills in the morning, and the fascination of evening, when the street was full of lights and the eyes of working girls, I proceeded to settle myself in the garret of an inn, in the Place du Pantheon, trying to live by teaching French to Russian students and by doing jobs of routine brain work, 
It was better to feel a faint pinch of hunger reading in the Luxembourg gardens than to eat my fill by sketching crankshafts till I could no longer think. From my window, I could see the square, the Pantheon Gate, and Rodin's Thinker. I would have liked to know the exact spot on which Dr. Tony Moillet had been shot in 1871 for tending the commune's wounded. The bronze thinker seemed to me to be meditating on that crime and waiting to be shot himself. After all, how insolent he was doing nothing but thinking, and how dangerous if he ever came to a conclusion. A social revolutionary had introduced me to the members of his party among the Russian emigre. He was a large, hairless gentleman of, of Americanized manners, often sent off by the party on missions to the United States. The Russian Social Revolutionary Party was passing through a serious crisis of morale since several police agents had been unmasked in its battle organization. For example, Azev and Zukenko, or Zuchenko. The militant who had greeted me on my arrival, with whom I had often discussed Maeterlinck and the meaning of life all night long, was called Patrick. He led an exemplary life, kept faith amid the general demoralization, and cultivated a healthy optimism. When the, when the Paris archives of the Okrana's Secret Service were opened in 1917, we found that Patrick was also a police agent, but that was really no longer of any importance. I led a many-sided life. I was attracted by the partisan warriors of Paris, that sub-proletariat of déclassé, emancipated men, dreaming of freedom and dignity and constantly on the verge of imprisonment. And among the Russians, I breathed much purer air, distilled in sacrifice, energy, and culture. I taught French to a stunning young woman who always wore red dresses, a maximalist, one of the few survivors of the attempt at Aptekarsky Island in St. Petersburg. There, three maximalists had presented themselves in uniform at a reception in the villa of the Prime Minister, Stolopin, and suffered themselves to be roasted in the hall so as to make sure that the villa would be blown up to practically nothing. People around me spoke of them as if they had only just gone out of the room, of Salomon Riss, alias Medved, the bear, who had joined the Okrana to disrupt and disorganize it, had been caught and recently hanged, of Petrov, who had done the same at St. Petersburg and had lately assassinated the head of the secret police, of Gershuni, who refused a pardon out of contempt for the Tsar. They dared not hang him all the same, then escaped and died here, not far from us, of tuberculosis, of Igor Sazanov, who twice offered up his life, first when he threw a bomb under von Plev's carriage and again when he killed himself in jail, a few months before he was due for release, in protest against the maltreatment of his comrades. The new theory of energy of Mach and Avenarius, revising the notion of matter, was of cardinal importance for us. Coming from these discussions, I would meet old Edward Farrell, selling his copies of L'Intransigeant on the corner of the Boulevard Saint-Michel and the Rue Soufflot. L'Intran, L'Intran, he proclaimed in his wares in a soft, trembling voice. He sported an improbable pair of worn-out boots and a complete authentic tramp's outfit. A disgraceful yellow straw hat sat like a halo on his head, bearded like Socrates, a lively glow in his eyes, which were the color of sane water. He lived wanting even elementary necessities among the lowest of the low. I never knew under what strains he had been brought so low, for certainly his was one of the finest intelligences of the libertarian movement, naturally heretical, loved and admired by the young. Deeply learned reciting and translating Virgil with lyrical passion in Down at Heel pubs in the Place Maubert, where we willingly followed him, a disciple of George Sorel and himself a theoretician of syndicalism, he blended this theory with the ideas of Messi or Mekisla Goldberg or Mekislas Goldberg, I don't know how to pronounce that, who practically died of hunger in the Latin Quarter, affirming that the highest revolutionary vocation was the thief's. 
It was Farrell who introduced me to the terrifying world of utmost poverty, spiritless degradation, the borderline of humanity, humanity under the rubble of the great city. There, a tradition of total overwhelming defeat had been kept up, as it still is, for at least ten centuries. These wretches were the lineal descendants of the first beggars of Paris, perhaps of Roman Lutetia's meanest plebes. They were older than Notre Dame, and neither Saint Genevieve nor the Blessed Virgin had ever been able to do anything for them. Proof, of course, that they were beyond redemption. I saw them in the bistros of La Maube, drinking their draft wine, eating the pork chops, re refuse, repairing the dressings, sometimes spectacularly faked on their sores. I heard them discuss the affairs of their guilds, the allotment of a particular begging pitch that had become vacant through the passing of a certain member, lately found dead under a bridge. Others would be replenishing their trays with matches and shoelaces, others again discreetly del delusing themselves or delousing themselves. You had to be invited to get into their place and they gave you intrigued, tearful and scornful looks. It smelled like a cage in a zoo in that place where at times the tramps slept leaning against a stretched line. Whenever the cold and the rain make the open ground and the arches under the bridges too in inhospitable. Between them, they only spoke armouche, a particular slang a bit different from that of the young males in flat caps sitting at the windows of the nearest bistros to keep an eye on their women, standing in the shadows of nearby doorways touting for business. These young men and their forty Sioux rent girls were the aristocrats of that milieu. I observed, terrified, what the city could do to man, the mangy pestiferous, kenneled cuts, existence to which it reduced him. And this helped me to understand Peter Lavrov's historical letters concerning social justice. The clochard is a spent individual, squeezed dry of personal initiative, who has learnt to enjoy feebly but stubbornly the meagre vegetable existence, which is all that he has. The rag pickers were a world apart, adjacent but separate, centering on the Berriere d'Italie at Saint Ouen. Some of the less abandoned managed to accumulate a positive treasure by exploiting an abundant raw material, the town's refuse. The genuine human refuse could not even do that, having too little energy and too much sloth to pursue the systematic efforts of the dustbin brigade. It was my lot during a bad time to spend some days in a related world, that of the hawkers of special editions of the big newspapers. Some poor wretches would stand at a side entrance of Le Matin in a special queue to buy ten copies which they would then sell in the Boulevard Saint-Denis, risking a punch in the face from the usual news vendor, all for twenty centimes. Any disturbance drew the attention of the police and vendors who would grab them and throw them into the street like the human ref refuse that they were. Get lost, you louse. I translated Russian novels and poems. Artsy Bashev, Belmont, Mariskovsky, <laughs> for a charming Russian journalist under whose signature they appeared. Thanks to this employment, I was able to buy onion soup, soup for feral at the, at the stroke of midnight by a brazier in Le Hall, beneath the squat, massive silhouette of Saint Eustache. One of the peculiar features of working-class Paris at this time was that it bordered extensively on the underworld, that is, on the vast world of irregulars, outcasts, paupers, and criminals. There were few essential differences between the young worker or artisan from the old central districts and the pimp from the alleys by Les Hal, Les, by Les Hal. A chauffeur or mechanic with any wits about him would pilfer all he could from the employers as a matter of course, out of class consciousness, one less for the governor, and because he was liberated of old fashioned morality. Working class attitudes, aggressive and anarchic, were pulled in opposite directions by two antagonistic movements, 
the revolutionary syndicalism of the CGT, which, with a fresh and powerful idealism, was winning the real proletariat to the struggle for positive demands, and the shapeless activity of the anarchist groups. Between and beneath these two currents, restless and disaffected masses were being borne along. Two extraordinary demonstrations of this time marked an epoch for me for the whole of Paris. I think that no historian will be able to ignore their significance. The first one took place on October 13, 1909. On that day, we heard the news of an incredible event. The execution of Francisco Ferrer, decreed by Mora and permitted by Alfonso VIII. Eighth? Thirteen? It's an X. And then three eyes. I think that's thirteenth. The founder of the modern school in Barcelona, condemned absurdly for a popular uprising of some days' duration, fell back into the ditch at Mont Jewish. Mont Jouche. <laughs> Shouting to the firing squad, I forgive you, children. Aim straight. Later on, he was rehabilitated by Spanish justice. I had written even before his arrest the first article in the great press campaign conducted on his behalf. His transparent innocence, his educational activity, his courage as an independent thinker, and even his man-in-the-street appearance endeared him infinitely to the whole of a Europe that was, at the time, liberal by sentiment and in intense ferment. A true international consciousness was growing from year to year, step by step with the progress of capitalist civilization. Frontiers were crossed without formalities. Some trade unions subsidized travel for their members. Commercial and intellectual exchanges seemed to be unifying the world. Already in 1905, the anti-Semitic pogroms in Russia had roused a universal wave of condemnation. From one end of the continent to the other, except in Russia and Turkey, the judicial murder of Ferrer Ferrer had, within 24 hours, moved whole populations to incensed protest. In Paris, the movement was spontaneous, but hundreds of thousands from every Faubourg, workers and ordinary folk impelled by a terrible indignation flowed towards the city centre. The revolutionary groups followed rather than guided these masses. The editors of revolutionary journals, taken aback by their sudden influence, spread the call to the Spanish embassy. The embassy would have been ransacked had not Lapine, the police commissioner, barricaded all entries to the boulevard Malasherbe. Angry riots started in these prosperous thoroughfares, lined with banks and aristocratic residences. The backwash of the crowds carried me among newspaper kiosks blazing on pavements and overturned omnibuses whose horses, painstakingly unharnessed, gazed stupidly at their empty contraptions. Police cyclists charged, weaving their machines to and fro at random. Lapine was shot at from ten yards by a revolver from somewhere in a group of journalists belonging to La Guerre Sociale, Le Libertaire and L'Anarchie. Weariness and the onset of night calmed the outburst which left the people of Paris with an exultant sensation of strength. The government authorized a legal demonstration two days after, led by Jarret. We marched along, 500,000 of us, surrounded by mounted gardes républicains, who sat, at all subdued, who sat all subdued, taking the measure of this newly risen power. There was a natural transition from this demonstration to the second. Miguel Almereda, Almereda, had participated in the organization of the first and was the moving force behind his its successor. I had helped him hide in Brussels where he had brusquely ridiculed my momentary Tolstoyan fancies. In short, we were friends. I told him, you're just an opportunist. Your people have started off quite wrong. He answered, as far as Paris is concerned, you are an ignoramus, my friend. You can purify yourself with Russian novels, but here the revolution needs cash. He incarnated human achievement in a measure so far practically unknown to me. He had the physical beauty of the purebred Catalan, tall forehead, blazing eyes, allied with an extreme 
elegance. A brilliant journalist, a captivating or orator, a capable libertarian politician, a draught in business, he was able to handle a crowd or fix a trial, to brave the bludgeons of the police, the revolvers of certain comrades, or the spite of the government, and to concoct fantastic intrigues. In the ministries, he had his connections, in the slums, his devoted friends. He was behind the disappearance from Clemenceau's drawer of a receipt for 500 francs, signed by an agent provocateur in the syndicalist movement. He then presented himself at the Assise court and was acquitted with the jury's congratulations. He organized the circulation of La Garde Sociale, whose guiding spirit he was, together with Gustave Hervé and Eugène Merlet, who was to be who was to become Paris's most powerful and Balzacian journalist. Almereda had experienced a sacrificing childhood, partly in a reformatory for a minor theft. It was he who, after the fairer demonstration, seized upon the Liebeuf affair. This was the prelude to a number of other dramas. It was a battle of low life. Liebeuf, a young worker of 20 who had grown up on the boulevard de Sebastopol, fell in love with a little streetwalker. The vice squad, those perse persecutors of girls, saw them together and had him condemned as a pimp. This he was not. On the contrary, his dream was to rescue this girl from the game. The officially provided defense counsel did not turn up at the trial. The accused man's protests were naturally of no avail. The petty sessions magistrate hurried through the proceedings in five seconds, as usual with these matters, and the police were, of course, on oath. Leobeuf felt branded with infamy. Once out of prison, he armed himself with a revolver, donned spiked armlets under his cloak, and went in quest of vengeance. To arrest him, they had to nail him to the wall with a saber, bl a saber blow. He had wounded four policemen and was condemned to death. The left-wing press indicted the vice squad and demanded a pardon for Leobeuf. Commissioner Lapine, a short gentleman capable of a cold hysteria, whose goatee presided every year over the bludgeoning of the May Day demonstrators, demanded his execution. Almereda wrote that if they dared to set up the guillotine, there would be more blood around it than beneath it. He appealed to the people of Paris to stop the execution by force. The Socialist Party lent its support to the movement. On the night of the execution, assorted crowds from all the faubourgs, from all those slums stalked by crime and misery, converged upon that unique spot in Paris, always ghastly by day and sinister by night, the Boulevard Arago. On one side, bourgeois houses, impervious to everything, with their windows neatly drawn on every man for himself. And God for all, if you please, on the other, two lines of stout chestnut, chestnut trees beneath the wall, a wall of great cemented stones, dull grayish brown, that most silent, most pitiless of prison walls, 20 feet high. I had come with Rurette, with Rene the Angry, with old Farrell, who, positively fanatical in affliction, seemed to float along unbelievably weak inside his ragged suit. The militants from all the groups were there, forced back by walls of black uniformed police executing bizarre maneuvers. Shouts and angry scuffles broke out when the guillotine wagon arrived, escorted by a squad of cavalry. For some hours there was a battle on the spot, the police charges forcing us ineffectively because of the darkness into side streets from which sections of the crowd would disgorge once again the next minute. Jaret was recognized at the head of one column and nearly brained. Almereda maneuvered in vain to break through the human barrier. There was plenty of violence and a little bloodshed. One policeman killed. At dawn, exhaustion quiet, quietened, the quietened the crowd. That's not a word. And at the instant when the blade fell upon a raging head, still yelling its innocence, a baffled frenzy gripped the twenty or thirty thousand demonstrators and found its outlet in a long drawn cry, murderers. The barriers of policemen now moved only lethargically. Do you see it? The wall, 
Renee shouted to me. When in the morning I returned to that spot of the boulevard, a huge policeman, standing on the square of fresh sand that had been thrown over the blood, was attentively treading a rose into it. A little farther off, leaning against the wall, Farrell was gently wringing his hands. Society is so iniquitous. From this day dates the revulsion and contempt that is aroused in me by the death penalty, which replies to the crime of the primitive, the retarded, the deprived, the half-mad, or the hopeless by nothing short of a collective crime, carried out coldly by men invested with authority, who believe that they are therefore innocent of the pathetic blood they shed. As for the endless torture of life imprisonment or of very lengthy sentences, I know of nothing more stupidly inhuman. After the fight for Pharaoh the philosopher, the battle for Leobeuf, the desperado demonstrated, although we could not see it, the seriousness of the blind alley in which the revolutionary movement of Paris was, all tendencies included. Energetic and powerful in 1906-07, the Confederation General du Travail began to decline, mellowed after a mere few years by the development of highly paid sections among the working class. The insurrectionism of Gustave Hervé and Miguel Almoreda revolved in a vacuum, expressed nothing in the end, but a craving for verbal and physical violence of a tiny minority. Bloated Europe, whose wealth and prosperity had grown to an unprecedented degree in the 30 years since 1880, still based its so social system upon ancient injustices, and thereby created in its great cities a, limit, a limited but numerous social stratum, to whom industrial progress brought no real hope, and only that minimum of consciousness that sufficed to shed light upon its own misfortune. More, through its excess of energy, as well as the incompatibility of its historical structure. With the new needs of society, the whole of this Europe was drawn towards resolving its problems in violence. We breathed the oppressive air of the prelude of war. Events herald heralded the catastrophe clearly enough. The Agadir incident, the partition of Morocco, the massacre of Casablanca, Italy's aggression against Tripolitania began the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. The futurist poet Marinetti detailed the splendor of bowels steaming in the sun of a battlefield. The Austrian Empire annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. The Tsar continued to borrow money from the French Republic and to hang and deport the best of the Russian intelligentsia. From the two ends of the globe, the Mexican and Chinese revolutions flamed out to illumine our enthusiasm. On the left bank, bordering the Latin Quarter, I had founded a study circle called Free Inquiry, which met upstairs in a socialist cooperative in the Rue Grégoire du Tour, down dark quarters cluttered with barrels. The houses nearby were brothels, with red lamps, large numerals, brightly lit doors and signs in 17th century script, the basket of flowers. The crowded thoroughfare of the Rue de Boussy, packed with stalls jutting onto the pavement, unsavory little bars and coaster mong mongers, gave me the sensation, or so I thought, of going back to the Paris of Louis the... <laughs> God damn it, 16th? Clearly I'm bad at history. And reading Roman numerals. I was familiar with all the old doors along the street and on the peeling facades above the advertisements for the hire of evening dress. I discerned the brand, invisible to others, of the reign of terror. In public meetings, I would dispute with Le Silence. Christian Democrats, who were fond of tough, strong-arm tactics, and with the Royalists, roused to a white-hot frenzy by Léon Daudet. When the tall Léon appeared on the platform, with his plump profile, rather like that of a declining bourbon or an Israelite financier, the similarity between these would be exact, we would form a battle square in a corner of the wall we had picked beforehand, and as soon as his thunderous voice proclaimed the monarchy, traditional, federalist, anti-parliamentarian, etc., our jeering interruptions would chime in. 
a century behind the times, Koblenz, the guillotine. And I would demand leave to speak, protected by a rampart of stalwart comrades. The Camelot's Durwa waited for this moment to charge our square, but we were not always defeated. By contrast, George Valois, a former anarchist, anarchist himself, but recently converted to royalism, was very willing to discuss his syndicalist royalist doctrine. He invoked Nietzsche, George Sorel, the social myth, the communal guilds of the Middle Ages, national sentiment. Meanwhile, certain comrades suggested that I should again take up the editing of L'Anarchie, now transferred from Montmartre to Romainville Gardens, and threatened by splits among the different tendencies. I made it a condition that the previous editorial and printing staff, a collection of scientific individualists, whose leading light was Raymond, should get out and that I should be allowed to recruit my own colleagues. Nevertheless, for a month, two staffs coexisted, the old one and mine. For a while, I caught up again with Raymond and Edward. They were intoxicated with their scientific algebraic formulae and enthralled to their dietary discipline. Absolute vegetarianism, no wine or coffee, tea or infusions, and we who ate otherwise were insufficiently evolved ceaselessly denouncing the shortcomings of feelings, invoking only scientific reason and conscious egoism. I could see clearly that their childish intoxication with scientism contained much more ignorance than knowledge and an intense desire to live differently at all costs. A more important conflict separated us, that of illegalism. They were already or were becoming outlaws primarily through the influence of Octave Garnier a handsome, swarthy, silent lad whose dark eyes were astoundingly hard and feverish. Small working class by origin, Octave had suffered a vicious beating on a building site in the course of a strike. He scorned all discussion with intellectuals. Talk, talk, he would mark softly, and off he would go on the arm of a blonde Rubenesque Flemish girl to prepare some dangerous nocturnal task or other. No other man that I have met in my whole life has ever so convinced me of the impotence and even the futility of the intellect when confronted with tough primitive creatures like this, rudely aroused to a form of intelligence that fits them purely technically, for the life struggle. He would have made an excellent seafarer for a polar ex expedition, a fine soldier for the colonies, or in another time, a Nazi stormtroop leader or an NCO for Rommel. There was no doubt of it, all he, could he, all he could be was an outlaw. His was a restless, uncontrolled spirit in quest of some impossible new dignity, how or what he did not know himself. Petty quarrels multiplied, Raymond, Edward, and Octave departed soon enough, and I transferred our print shop, in which we lived together as comrades, to the top of Belleville behind the Chaumont Hills, in an old working men's house in the Rue Fassade. I set out to give a new emphasis to the paper in the form of a turn from individualism to social action. I opened a polemic against Elie Faure, the art, the art historian who, citing Nietzsche, had just proclaimed the civilizing function of war. I noted, almost enthusiastically, the suicide of Paul and Laura Lefargue, the son-in-law and daughter of Karl Marx. Lefargue, having reached the age of 60, an age at which he decided active creative life was over, administered poison to himself and his wife. I sought to affirm a doctrine of solidarity and revolt in the here and now, quoting Elysee Recluse. Man and nature become conscious of itself. Oh, man is nature, become conscious of itself. Of Marx, I knew practically nothing. We denounced syndicalism as a future statism, as terrible as any other. The cult of the workers, a reaction against the politicians, who were primarily lawyers interested in their parliamentary careers, struck us as being over-rigid and as carrying within itself the seeds of an anti-intellectual careerism. The end of 1911 saw dramatic happenings. Joseph the Italian, a little militant with frizzled hair who dreamed of a free life in the bush of Argentina, as far away as possible from the towns, was found murdered on the Maloon Road. From the grapevine, we gathered that an individualist from Lyon, but not 
by name. I did not know the man who had been traveling with him by car had killed him. The Italian, having first wounded himself, fumbling with a revolver. However, it may have happened one comrade had murdered or done another. Any informal investigation shed no light on the matter and only, an, only annoyed the scientific legalists. Since I had expressed hostile opinions towards them, I had an unexpected visit from Raymond. If you don't want to disappear, be careful about condemning us. He added laughingly, do whatever you like. If you get in my way, I'll eliminate you. You and your friends are absolutely cracked, I replied, and absolutely finished. We faced each other exactly like small boys over a red cabbage. He was still squat and strapping, baby-faced and merry. Perhaps that's true, he said, but it's the law of nature. A positive wave of violence and despair began to grow. The outlaw anarchists shot at the police and blew out their own brains. Others, overpowered before they could fire the last bullet into their own heads, went off sneering to the guillotine. One against all. Nothing means anything to me. Damn the masters, damn the slaves, and damn me. I recognized in the various newspaper reports faces I had met or known. I saw the whole of the movement founded by Libertad dragged into the scum of society by a kind of madness. And nobody could do anything about it, least of all myself. The theoreticians, terrified, headed for cover. It was like a collective suicide. The newspapers put out a special edition to announce a particularly daring outrage committed by bandits in a car on the Rue Ordinay in Montmartre against the, against the bank cashier carrying half a million francs. Reading the descriptions, I recognized Raymond and Octave Garnier, the lad with the piercing black eyes who distrusted intellectuals. I guess the logic of their struggle. In order to save Bonneau, now hunted and trapped, they had to find either money, money to get away from it all, or else a speedy death in this battle against the whole of society. Out of solidarity, they rushed into this squalid, doomed struggle with their little revolvers and their petty, trigger-happy arguments. And now there were five of them, lost and once again without money even to attempt flight, and against them towered money, 100,000 francs reward for the first informer. They were wandering in the city without escape, ready to be killed somewhere, anywhere, in a tram or a cafe, content to feel utterly cornered, expendable, alone, in defiance of a horrible world. Out of solidarity, simply to share this bitter joy of trying to be killed, without any illusions about the struggle, as a good many told me when I met them in prison afterwards, Others joined the first few, such as red-haired René. He too was a restless spirit. And poor little André Sudi. I had often met Sudi at public meetings in the Latin Quarter. He was a perfect example of the crushed childhood of the, black alley, uh, of the back alleys. He grew up on the pavements, TB at 13, VD at 18, convicted at 20 for stealing a bicycle. I had brought him books and oranges in the Tonneau Hospital. Pale, sharp-featured, his accent, com his accent common, his eyes a gentle gray. He would say, "I'm an unlucky blighter. Nothing I can do about it." He earned his living in grocer's shops in the Rue Mouffetard, where the assistants rose at six, arranged the display at seven, and went upstairs to sleep in a garret after nine p.m dog-tired, having seen their bosses defrauding housewives all day by weighing the beans short, watering the milk, wine, and paraffin, and falsifying the labels. He was sentimental. The laments of street singers moved him to the verge of tears. He could not approach a woman without making a fool of himself, and half a day in the open air of the meadows gave him a lasting dose of intoxication. He experienced a new lease on life, if he heard someone call him comrade or explain that one could, one must, become a new man. Back in his shop, he began to give double measures of beans to the housewives, who thought him a little mad. The bitterest joking helped him to live, convinced as he was that he was not long for this world, seeing the price of medicine. One morning, a group of enormous police officers burst into our lodgings at the press, revolvers in hand. 
A bare-footed little girl of seven had opened the door when the bell rang and was terrified by this eruption of armed giants. Jouin, the deputy director of the Sûreté, a thin gentleman with a long, gloomy face, polite and almost likable, came in later, searched the building, and spoke to me amiably of ideas, of Sébastien Faure, who he admired, of the deplorable way in which the outlaws were discrediting a great ideal. Believe me, he sighed, the world won't change so quickly. He seemed to me neither malicious nor hypocritical, only a deeply distressed man doing a job conscientiously. In the afternoon, he sent for me, called me into his office, leant on his elbows under the green lampshade, and talked to me somewhat after this fashion. I know you pretty well. I should be most sorry to cause you any trouble, which could be very serious. You know these circles, these men, who are very unlike you, and would shoot you in the back. Basically, they are absolutely finished. I can assure you, stay here for an hour and we'll discuss them. Nobody will ever know anything of it, and I guarantee that there will be no trouble at all for you. I was ashamed, unbelievably ashamed, for him, for myself, for everybody, so ashamed that I felt no shock of indignation, nor any fear. I told him, I am sure that you must be embarrassed yourself, talking to me like this. But not at all. All the same, he was doing the dirty job, as if overwhelmed by it. Go ahead then, I said. Arrest me if you think you've got the right to. I only ask one thing. Bring me some supper. I am very hungry. The deputy director of the Sûreté started up, seemingly relieved. Some supper? It's a little late, but I'll see what I can do. Do you have cigarettes? That was how I entered prison for a long time. The laws voted in, in 1893 following Veillant's harmless bomb attack named Loi Scalierat or anti-villain laws by Clemenceau allowed the arrest of anybody. A ministerial directive had just ordered their application. In a cell of La Santé behind the wall, the specialty guarded section, or the specially guarded section, reserved for men condemned to death, I began to study seriously. The worst of it all was the constant hunger. From a legal point of view, I could easily have cleared myself, since the paper's management and edit editorship was in the name of Riret, but I was determined to assume full responsibility. The murders and collective suicide continued. Of these, I picked up, I picked up only distant echoes. In Sanad Forest, five hunted young men, chilled by the mists, violently hijacked an automobile. That same day in Chantilly, they attacked a branch of the Société Générale. More blood in Paris itself, Place du Havre. In the middle of the day, the police officer Garnier fell while handing out a traffic ticket to the passengers of a gray car shot through the heart by another Garnier. Octave. Uh, by another Garnier. Octave. Meanwhile, the reward of 100,000 francs was burrowing into the brains of certain conscious egoists. And the arrests began. Bonnard, caught by surprise in a small shop at Ivory, fought in a darkened back room with Jouin, the deputy director of the Sûreté, shot him point blank, pretended momentarily to also be dead and fled through a window. They caught up with him at Choisy-le-Roi, Choisy where he defended himself with a pistol and wrote, in between the shooting, a letter which absolved his comrades of complicity. He lay between two mattresses to protect himself against the final onslaught, and was killed or else killed himself. No one really knows which. Octave Garnier and René Vallet caught up at Nogent sur Marne, in a villa, where they were hiding out with their women, underwent an even longer siege, taking on the civil police, the gendarmerie, and the zouave. They fired hundreds of bullets, viewing their attackers as murderers, and themselves as victims, and, when the house was dynamited, blew out their own brains. 
Rebellion's just another dead end, nothing we can do about it. We may as well hurry up and reload. At heart, they resembled the dynam dynamiteros of Spain, who stood up in front of tanks shouting, Viva la fe, bidding defiance to the world. Raymond, betrayed by a woman for a considerable sum, was taken by surprise and arrested near the Place Clichy. He thought he loved and was loved in return for the first time. André Soudy, too, betrayed by an anarchist writer, was arrested at Burke Plage where he was nursing his tuberculosis. Edward Carroway, who had no part in these events, was betrayed by the family hiding him, and although armed like the others, was arrested without any attempt at self-defense. This athletic young man was exceptional in being quite incapable of murder, though quite ready to kill himself. The others, too, were all betrayed. Some of the anarchists shot at those informers, one of whom was killed. Nonetheless, the shrewdest one of them continued to edit a little individualist journal on the blue cover of which the new man could be seen struggling up from the shadows. My examination was short and pointless, since I was actually accused of no offense. The first magistrate who interrogated me for identification purposes, an aging, refined personage, nearly threw a fit of temper as he meditated on my future. A revolutionary at twenty, yes, and you will be a plutocrat at forty. I do not think so, I replied in all seriousness, and I am still thankful to him for that edifying outburst of anger. I endured the long, enriching experience of cell life, allowed no visits or newspapers, with only the squalid statutory rations, which were picked at by all the thieves on the staff, and some good books. I understood and ever since have always missed the old Christian custom of retreats, which men spent in monasteries, meditating face to face with themselves and with God, in other words, with the vast living solitude of the universe. It will be good if that custom is revived in the time when man can at last devote thought to himself. My solitary confinement was difficult, often more than difficult, suffocating, and I was surrounded by awful suffering and I did not escape, did not seek to escape any of the troubles that could have come my way, except for DB of which I was afraid, seeking to exhaust them, demanding the greatest efforts of myself. Furthermore, I believe that, however bitter the situation, one ought to go all the way for the sake of the others and for oneself, so as to gain from the experience and to grow from it. I also believe that a few very simple rules will suffice for that end. Physical and intellectual discipline, exercise, absolutely necessary for the man in a cell. Walks for meditation, I did my six miles around the cell every day. Intellectual work and recourse to that exaltation, or light spiritual intoxication, which is provided by great works of poetry. Altogether, I spent around 15 months in solitary confinement, in various conditions, some of them quite hellish. The trial of 1913 assembled on the benches of the Seas Court, about 20 prisoners, of whom maybe half a dozen were innocent. In the course of a month, 300 contradictory witnesses paraded before the bar of the court, the, inconsequentia the inconsequentiality of human testimony is astonishing. Only one, in ten, only one in ten can record more or less clearly what they have seen with any accuracy, observe and remember, and then be able to recount it, resist the suggestions of the press and the temptations of his own imagination. People see what they want to see, what the press or the questioning suggest, Against the half-dozen main culprits, there was no worthwhile evidence since they denied everything. Six witnesses out of 40 contradicted each other in their identifications of the most incriminated defendants, but sometimes in this hodgepodge of confused testimony, a single word would hit the mark and convince the jury. Someone had recalled a word pronounced with a certain accent, a shout of Sudis, the man with the rifle in the middle of a minor street fight. Come on, fellows, let's blow. And no further doubt was possible because of the tone, the accent, the slang. It was hardly a piece of scientific evidence, but it was human evidence all the same. On some days, it became a trial of the police who were pumping 
a star witness, an old half-blind, half-deaf peasant woman, to make her identify photographs. The head of the Sudete Xavier Jouichard, a man of aesthetic pretensions, admitted having hit a woman, shouting at her, You're young, you can still become a tart. As for your kids, they can go to hell on the public, assist on the public assistance. Nice fella. Dr. Paul, an expert in forensic medicine, pomaded, elegant, and somewhat fleshy, lectured on the corpses with visible relish. He had been conducting post-mortems post on all the murder victims of Paris for the last 40 years, after which he would go off to a good lunch, select a tie to wear for tea, and, leaning against the man mantelpiece of some drawing room, recount his 10,000 anecdotes of crime. Beaming M. Bertillon, the inventor of anthro anthropometry, modestly admitted that he could be mistaken over fingerprints. There was a probability of error of about one in a billion. The lawyer who, in an attempt to embarrass Bertillon, had elicited this bombshell from him, could not recover from his own confusion. The principal defendants, Raymond Calamin, André Soudy, Monnier, a gardener, and Eugène Sieudonnet, a joiner, denied everything and, in theory, had a plausible case. In reality, irrefutable signs of guilt were killing them. Apart from Sieudonnet, who was in fact innocent, not of all complicity, but of the particular aspect in which he stood accused. His arrest had arisen from a resemblance between his dark eyes and another pair of eyes, still darker, which were in the graveyard. He alone shouted his innocence in frenzy with no sign of, of apathy, which made a striking contrast with the real culprits, insolent and jeering, whose whole behavior was a calm challenge. We dare you to prove it. Since everyone knew the truth, proof was superfluous, as they themselves were aware, but they continued acting after the vocation as desperados, smiling, blustering, taking notes. Raymond denied the right of the court to judge, but weakened in the face of authority, directing little sallies, like a peevish schoolboy, at the president of the court. Sudi, cross-examined as to whether a rifle was his property, replied, not mine, but as you know, Proudhon said that property is theft. The prosecution had intended to unearth, for the benefit of the public, an authentically novelettish conspiracy, assigning me to the role of its theoretician, but had to abandon this project after, after the second session. I had believed that I would manage to be acquitted, but now understood that in such an atmosphere the acquittal of a young Russian and a militant at that was impossible despite the entire clarity of the facts of the case. For no direct or indirect responsibility for these tragedies could be laid against me. I was there only because of my categorical refusal to talk, that is, to become an informer. I demolished the prosecution's case on various points of detail, which was easy. I defended our principles of uninhibited analysis, solidarity, and rebellion, which was much more difficult, and I annoyed the innocent culprits by demonstrating that society manufactured crime, criminals, desperate ideas, suicides, and the poison of money. There were two powerful testimonies, one from the convict Hook, or Huck, head shaved, dressed in brown overalls, handcuffed at the, at the witness stand. I agreed to testify against my mates because I was promised a pardon. That's Huck saying this. I am here to take it back, your honor, because I was a coward and I don't want to become scum. And he went back down to his torment. A pretty young female worker wearing a hat decorated with flowers came to defend her fiancé, Monnier, who was facing the guillotine. He had only kissed her twice, she said, with childish embarrassment. I swear he's innocent. And he really was, but only for her in this world. Bonds of genuine sympathy were formed between the defendants and their counsel, except for Paul Reynaud, who defended some accessory or other with reasonable skill, but still remained aloof. Moreau Giafferi, Leonine in appearance, a Napoleon in a necktie, 
thundered on behalf of Dieudonné, his grand arm-waving eloquence invoking the crucified Christ, the French Revolution, the grief of mothers, the nightmare fears of children sickened me at first. But the end of 20 minutes of it, or by the end of 20 minutes of it, I was hypnotized, just like the jury in the gallery, by the power of his astounding rhetoric. A relationship almost of friendliness drew me towards Adad, who committed suicide in Paris some years ago, and what better course was there for an old penniless lawyer? And to César Kempinchi, a cool, brilliant debater who appealed only to reason, though with a certain irony. It was to see him again much later, seriously wounded in the First World War, and Minister of the Navy in the Second, one of those who favored resistance to the death. He died under house arrest in Marseille in 1941, just as I was embarking for America. I reflected that if these desperados had been able, before their struggle, to meet men like this, understanding, cultured, and liberal-minded, both by inclination and profession, perhaps more apparently than really so, but even that would have been enough, they would not have entered upon their paths of darkness. The most immediate cause of the revolt and ruin seemed to me to lie in their isolation from human contacts. They were living in no company but their own, divorced from the world, living in one where they were nearly always subject to some confining and second-rate milieu. What had preserved me from their one-dimensional thinking, from their bitter anger, from their pitiless view of society, had been the fact that since childhood I had been exposed to a world full of enduring hope, rich in human values, that of the Russians. During the trial, we were confined in the tiny cells of the concierge conciergerie, dark holes honeycombed in the ancient stonework of the same buildings where tourists still go to visit the prison of the Girondins and Marie Antoinette's cell. Going to court, we would reassemble, escorted by Garde Républicain beneath old archways, which gave us the feeling of being underground. We would walk up a corkscrew staircase inside one of the pointed towers that overlooked the Seine, and, passing through a little side door, enter the great courtroom of the Assis, which would be buzzing with the presence of a crowd. Ladies would come as if to a show. A fat usher, as much like a pig as a man can possibly be, moved solemnly between the jury, the bench, and the public. The faces of the jury revealed twelve conscientious men in the streets who were trying to understand. The bench was composed of short or fat old men, drowsy or short-sighted, dressed in red. Two prosecutors were appearing, the public prosecutor and his deputy. The former was measured and of a considerable appearance. The latter was of pedestrian mediocrity, frequently dishonest in his arguments. Severin, Sebastien Faure, and Pierre Martin, the companion of Kropotkin at the Lyons trial in 1883, appeared in my defense and to defend on the grounds of the right to asylum the shopkeeper who had sheltered Bonneau. The last, blah, blah, blah. The last ses session took 20 hours and the verdict was announced at dawn. We waited for it, sitting together in two anterooms in a strange atmosphere rather like our old meetings in Montmartre. The usual arguments started all over again. Our lawyers, pale-faced, came to fetch us. Then the sweltering, silent courtroom and twenty prisoners, tense, erect, and hard-faced. Four death sentences, several condemned to hard labor for life. The only acquittals were for the women, who were in any case innocent, but apart from this, Parisian juries were reluctant to find women guilty. They had acquitted Madame Steinhal, who was accused of murdering her husband. They acquitted Madame Joseph Caillot, wife of the former prime minister, who had killed the editor of Le Figaro. Later, they acquitted the anarchist Germaine Burton, who had killed a royalist leader. Dieu Donné was condemned to death, even though no one doubted his innocence, which was com compromised by his faulty alibis. Once more, he shouted his guiltlessness and, alone among the accused, seemed on the verge of collapse. Raymond, who had demanded an acquittal, jumped up, his face crimson, and interjected violently. Dieu Danae is innocent. It's me. Me that did the shooting. 
The president requested him to sit down, for the pleadings were over and confession no longer had any juridical value. I myself received five years solitary confinement, but I had managed to get a ridet acquitted. Two revolvers discovered on the premises of the papers served to justify my conviction, which was provoked, no doubt, by my calm hostility during the hearings. I found this justice nauseating. It was fundamentally more criminal than the worst criminals. It probably showed. I was just a different sort of enemy from the guilty ones. As I pondered this, the enormity of my sentence did not surprise me. I only wondered if I would be able to live that long, for I was very weak, at any rate, physically. I made up my mind to live it out, and was very ashamed to be thinking of myself like this, next to others who... We said our farewells to one another beneath the high vaults of the terror, through a frightful slip, through a frightful slip. While I was talking to Raymond, I used an expression from which I had I have never forgiven myself. You live and learn, I remarked. I cannot not, I cannot now say why, perhaps because I had just decided in favor of living. He stared and then broke into laughter. Living is just the problem. Forgive me, I broke out. He shrugged his shoulders. Of course, man, my mind's set. An hour later, in the pale light of morning, I was once again pacing around my, my suffocating cell. Somebody was sobbing incessantly in the next cell, and it got on my nerves. A little old warder, kindly and sad, came in, averting his face. Karui, Edward, is dying. Can you hear him? I could indeed hear a queer panting noise coming from beyond the sobs next door. That's him gasping away. He took some poison that he got hidden in the soles of his shoes. Well, well, what a life. He had not been condemned to death, but was disgusted with himself and with everything, unjustly linked as a result of circumstances. He did not want raised, paying for somebody else. The obviously innocent Dieu Donné was reprieved, in other words, given forced labor for life. Strange justice. He whom I had seen in terror at the idea of death, aging twenty years and a few months, for eighteen years fought fantastically against his servitude, escaping several times and spending years in solitary confinement. After his final escape, he reached Brazil. Through the good offices of Albert Londres, he was able to return to France. He was never one of the, des the desperate ones. On the contrary, he desperately wanted to live his life without worries. Raymond was so stolid in the death cell that they did not keep the date of the execution from him. He spent the waiting period in reading. In front of the guillotine, he noticed the group of reporters and shouted to them, A charming sight, isn't it? Sudi's last-minute request was for a cup of coffee with cream and some croissants, his last pleasure on earth, appropriate enough for that grey morning when people were happily eating their breakfasts in the little bistros. It must have been too early, for they could only find him a little black coffee. Out of luck, he remarked, right to the end. He was fainting with fright and nerves, and had to be supported while he was going down the stairs. But he controlled himself, and, when he saw the clearness of the sky over the chestnut trees, hummed a sentimental street song, Hail Ol, Last Morning of Mine. Monnier, usually taciturn, was crazy with anxiety, but mastered himself and became calm. I learned these details only a long time afterwards. I have not mentioned others whom I only glimpsed among the crowd, like Lacombe the miner who had executed a bookseller, and police informer in an alley in Clichy. He let himself be captured at the gingerbread fair and committed suicide in the Santé Prison by climbing onto the roofs during exercise time. He died at midday precisely after speaking with his lawyer and the prison governor. He was so determined to die that he dived headfirst onto the ground, reducing his head to pulp and crushing the vertebrae of his neck. So ended the second explosion of anarchism in France. The first, equally hopeless, was that of 1891-94, to signaled by the outrages of Ravachol, Emile Henry Vaillant, and Cassirio. The same psychological features and the same social factors were present in both phases. The same exacting idealism in the breasts of uncomplicated men whose energy could no could find no outlet in achieving a higher dignity or sensibility, 
because any such outlet was physically denied to them. Conscious of their frustration, they battled like madmen and were beaten down. In those times, the world was an integrated structure, so stable in appearance that no possibility of substantial change was visible within it. As it progressed up and up and on and on, masses of people who lay in its path were all the while being crushed. The harsh condition of the workers improved only very slowly, and for the, the vast majority of the proletariat, there was no way out. The declassed elements on the proletarian fringe found all roads barred to them except those that led to squalor and degradation. Above the heads of these masses, wealth accumulated, insolent and proud. The consequences of this situation arose inexorably. Crime, class struggles, and their trail of bloody strikes and frenzied battles of one against all. These struggles also testified to the failure of an ideology. Between the copious theorizing of Peter Kropotkin and Elisée Reclus and the rage of Albert Libertad, the collapse of anarchism in the bourgeois jungle was now obvious. Kropotkin had grown up in a completely different Europe, one less stable, where the ideal of liberty seemed to have some future, and people believed in revolution and education. Recluse had fought for the, co the commune. The confidence inspired by the greatness of its thwarted vision had lasted him for the rest of his days. He believed in the saving power of science. On the eve of war in Europe, science was functioning solely to assist the progress of a traditionalist and barbaric social order. One felt the approach of an era of violence, inescapable. In other lands, namely Poland and Russia, the revolutionary movement confronted regimes of a mongrel character, half absolutist and half capitalist. There, the movement was able to concentrate these diffuse energies and channel them along ways of sacrifice, at the end of which lay victories that were not only possible, but popularly desired. The men, the situation, and the conflicts were almost the same, only with a historical complexion different from that in France. The rentier state, as Yves Guillot put it. In Poland, Joseph Pils Pilsudski's Socialist Party, PPS, was raiding treasury vans and tax offices, attacking governors and policemen. In Russia, the Social Revolutionary Party was conducting a similar campaign, and the combat groups of the Bolshevik faction of social democrats, including the extraordinary terrorist Kamel, the intellectual and laboratory maker Krasin, the skillful organizer Koba, Strong, Koba Stalin, the man of action Tsitsanzi, and the courier, and the courier Litvinov, were conducting the struggle for the party's income on the highways, the public places of Tiflis, and the ships of Baku, bomb and revolver in hand. In Italy, in Pagine Libera, June 1, 1911, a young socialist agitator, Benito Mussolini, was chanting the praises of the anarchist Desperados. Of this hard childhood, this troubled adolescence, all those terrible years, I regret nothing as far as I myself am concerned. I am sorry for those who grow up in this world without ever experiencing the cruel side of it, without knowing utter frustration, and the necessity of fighting, however blindly, for mankind. Any regret I have is only for the energies wasted in struggles that were bound to be fruitless. These struggles have taught me that, in any man, the best and the worst live side by side and sometimes mingle, and that what is worst comes through the corruption of what is best.